Hello, friends. Welcome to No Cap Room. My name is Jake Fisher, senior NBA reporter for Yahoo Sports. With me once again, back from vacation, back from Disneyland. It's senior NBA writer for Yahoo Sports. It's my man. It's your man. It's everyone's man. It's Dan Devine. How are you, buddy? I'm doing great, Jake. Thanks so much for holding down the four while I was gone. Shouts out to J.E. Skeets, the, the indomitable, the incredible, the legend, the Yahoo Sports ball don't lie OG for coming in and uh, filling in, did a wonderful job. And uh, I'm sorry to report that J.E. Skeets is not here this week, that I am back, everybody. Sorry about that. Listen, man, whenever someone in the wild says to me, I love the pod, they always say, yeah, I really like what you and Dan got. So... <laughs> As much as Skeets did fill in the chair, kept it warm, I'm happy you're back too. No, oh, that's nice. I did hear it from a couple of people. Like, so like more more my wife's friends than my friends, like, but for, you know, friends that we saw when we were out on vacation in California, they said like they, they like the show partially because they enjoy basketball, partially because they like the vibe of the show, and partially because they occasionally get to learn little bits about Sarah's family. So that's uh, <laughs> she's like, she's like I, I get to learn about, they said, I get to learn a little bit about what's going on with Sarah and her kids by listening to your basketball show. And I was like, well, that's a very thin slice of the audience that I'm serving, but at least yeah. I'm serving somebody. Well, I will say to them, as I said to a friend in the NBA for years who has now left the NBA to go back to the college game, shout out Alex Klein, new general manager of the Syracuse basketball program. He always, he always say to me, you don't post on Instagram enough. I, I don't know what you're, I don't know what you're up to in life. I would say, then just, just fucking call me. Why do you need me to, why do you need me to post something online? Why do you need me to put out a podcast to understand what my family's doing? Now that's very kind of them to, to check in and see what's up with the divine household while also giving us a, hopefully a subscription. That's right. And a download. There Five you go. Five star reviews, please. Ben, if you're listening, uh, OJ, if you're listening, not that OJ, uh, you know, <laughs> as, as many five-star reviews as we can get. Although I guess, listen, I don't know. I mean, that OJ can't listen anymore, all right. That's a really good point, you know, uh, but, you know, we'll take whatever support we can get, I guess. There you go. Let's get this back on the rails. We'll get the five out later. <laughs> we'll get the Team USA first after the Americans secured a 103-86 redemption victory That's over right. South Sudan. You won't get us one more time like that, South Sudan. No, sir. Although, if we want to keep marrying the basketball and family, it was super clutch that Team USA was up a pretty significant margin at halftime, I believe 19 points, because the game started at 3 Eastern. First time we ever scheduled a dog groomer to come clip Arugula's nails at 4 <laughs> oh, o'clock. Rugi. It didn't go well. Rugi needs some super, super drugs to help chill her out the next time we try to take her to a vet and get those heavy-duty nail clippers. But Team USA... Brought the heavy duty offense and defense. Oh my goodness, this guy's warmed up already, ladies and gentlemen. I had a coffee today, which I never do. So I feel like <laughs> I'm on PEDs right now, but that's okay. Let's make it happen. Yeah, the Americans now 2 0. They have qualified through to the quarterfinals of the Olympic tournament. Same with Canada, Germany, and France. But we'll have plenty of time to talk about that next week. And I think our scheduling is going to, I'm not going to confirm, is going to put us right in a perfect window to talk about what is happening in the knockout round and what is to come. So for now, let's just focus on the takeaways that we can marinate over the next couple of days before Team USA plays Puerto Rico on Saturday, which I think the big topic, a banner item that's going to run on all the talk shows today is going to be Jason Tatum starts after being benched right. in PCD and Joel Embiid does not play at all after his whole experience that I think the most recent element of his whole him versus France and the whole starting conundrum, blah, 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 was him like egging on the crowd, booing him in France before the game. That yesterday. doesn't sound like Joel Embiid. Are you sure he, he heard a booing crowd and decided to egg them on and say he wanted some more? That doesn't sound like him at all. But what's, what's, what's different about that is he absolutely knew he wasn't going to play. So he's still yeah. waving it on, which is just classic troll, Joel Embiid. But yeah, I think that stuff is, you're going to hear about that all over the place. And Steve Kerr has made it very clear he's going to be shifting the starting lineup and shifting his rotations depending on the matchup. They obviously have an embarrassment of riches in terms of versatility and personnel to be able to do that. And if these guys are 
so willing to take certain seats and steps back at certain times. It's it's kudos to them. But I mean, Kerr's already said that against Puerto Rico, he's going to be starting Drew and Joel and beat again after inserting Devin Booker and Anthony Davis. So is there anything else really you want to mention on that, Dan, or, or do you want to get into any other particular insights from this victory for the Americans? I think the big thing through two games, obviously you, you mentioned it, there's no other team in the Olympic field that has 12 NBA players on it let alone 12 players at the level of, of what Team USA can bring to bear. Kano Canada gets close, um, but there, there, there is no team that can go to the bench and check in five all-stars, right? Or, or <laughs> near all-stars, right? So the, the point, there's, it, w- it's becoming a sort of script in these games. The starting lineup, whoever f- forms the starting lineup, struggles a little bit with the other team's starters, or maybe it's a tie game, or maybe they're down a little bit. And then Kerr goes to the bench and in comes, in yesterday's case, Kevin Durant, Bam Adebayo, uh, Anthony Edwards, and Drew Holiday came in to play with Steph. Then about a minute later, Stephen Curry goes out and Derek White comes in. And South Sudan just kind of stopped scoring for a while. I think they did. They think they had two, uh, four points over the next four or five minutes. And then, you know, before you know it, what was a tense 10-10 game is now a double-digit double USA lead. And the game's basically over midway through the second quarter. So I think that to me, the the thrust of that second unit, which was great in the exhibition games, and we t- talked about that, the line changes, and now with Kevin Durant back in the fold, and maybe no better indication of how who starts and who doesn't doesn't really matter than Kevin Durant, admittedly coming off the injury, but the most decorated scorer in American Olympic history, um, he's coming off the bench and seems fine with it and affords Steve Kerr the opportunity to just say, we're going to throw out Bam as the backstop, Drew at the point of attack, Derek White at the point of attack, Anthony Edwards and Kevin Durant on the wings. It's a miserable defensive experience for everybody to have to deal with, and they can just play random offense on the other side of it. Like, you get a stop, you push, and that's how America is going to outclass everybody, is you get a stop, you push offense, they cannot stop you the other way. So it's not... As long as the the, the, stru- the script seems to be, as long as Team USA doesn't turn the ball over a ton and they're able to shut down the three-point line, which was they were not able to do against South Sudan in the exhibition game, they did a much better job of it yesterday, in part perhaps because Joel Embiid was not playing, they were playing smaller with more wings and they were switching everything, so that's another club in the bag, pretty effective one. It's kind of night-night if they're able to do both those things. Whether they're able to do both those things against higher-level opponents Germany, France, Serbia again, etc. remains to be seen. But I think you have to look at it and say the str- this questions about Steph, questions about Embiid, questions about Tatum, whatever. The structure of this thing is a real monster when it gets rolling. Yeah, I think one quick note on the KD off the bench. We talked about it with Vinny Goodwill on his show on Tuesday. Good word with Goodwill about when I talked with KD just about all of his defensive versatility stuff in Atlanta in February. But I think just one real key takeaway I had from that conversation with him, aside from how freaking tall he is, is that (laughs) the guy really just loves to like look over, look under every stone of the game of basketball. And I am not in France. I am in my typical at home background for our YouTube viewers, but I'd have to imagine just from my conversations with him over the years, and particularly that one that showed insight to his thinking right now, he's probably like rubbing his hands at this quote unquote challenge. Just like how Michael Jordan can like pick a random guy to be like, that guy's coming for me. I need to end him. (laughs) Similarly, I think KD likes to look at certain things in the game that are something that he hasn't done before and be like, I'm gonna go master that. And being the potentially most lethal sixth man in Olympic men's basketball history when there's a guy named Carmelo Anthony who he's really got to chase. If, if, you know, LeBron's chasing MJ's ghosts throughout his career, like Katie's been that guy. Katie's been the superstar who's checked out and then seen Carmelo come in and just drop absolute fire from all around the arc. So him basically mimicking that exact role on this team has been fun to watch. And if I'm playing armchair psychologist, I would think that there's that 
added element to him of like, man, I'm a, I'm gonna do something that's really hard to do conceptually, like for a lot of guys to the fact we'll talk about it in a little bit. The team USA was drilling that exact sequence for all these all stars during minicamp, being on the bench for a while in real time and coming off and still feeling in rhythm. So shout out to KD. One funny thing about KD that I noticed in this game, because also shouts to Tyrese Halliburton for coming off the bench and really playing well after being one of the other DNP CDs against Serbia. Yeah, he immediately fir- drilled two threes. Yeah. His first two. And then be- he's hot. He's feeling it. And there was someone with the Team USA outfit in Manila who I remember having a drink with at one point during all the Philippines stuff. And they were saying to me, you know, I think Tyrese is the best catch and shoot three point shooter on that iteration of the team. So it's interesting to see him more in that type of role in this team. But so he's hit two. He's feeling hot. He's on the right wing. There's one sequence, probably like two and a half minutes left. I remember in the second quarter and he's wide open and Katie's got the ball up top. I'm like, oh, why isn't Kevin passing to Tyrese? And then the camera panned a little bit and you saw this screen action of Steph flaring out to the corner. And it reminded me like watching the Olympics the potentially greatest, highest talent, you know, American outfit ever still have some tendencies of dudes playing pickup and being like, oh, there's that other guy I want to get the ball to. Yeah. Was such a funny delight of just me like laughing to myself on the couch thinking like, oh, Tyrese Halliburton is the fifth guy in my Tuesday run and people don't necessarily like to (laughs) give the ball to sometimes because they know it's going up type of thing. It was just a funny little moment I wanted to call to attention here. Also would be remiss if we did not specifically shout out Bam Adebayo, uh, leading scorer uh, in the win over South Sudan, 18 points off the bench. And you really saw just the degree to which he can now do pretty much everything on a basketball court. There's, you know, he's been somebody who could bring the ball up and initiate offense for Miami for a number of years now. Been somebody who can be a short role playmaker, facilitator out of the high post, handoff hub kind of player. Somebody who's going to get be a screen and dive guy, a lob threat, get downhill, attack the offensive glass. Obviously, defends one through five very famously. I'll talk, you know talk to our guy Vinny in Vegas about that, like feeling like he still kind of doesn't get enough respect for what he does, the breadth and quality of his work on the defensive end. Not not here. I voted him Defensive Player of the Year a couple of years ago. Neither here nor there. <laughs> yeah, him like running out and denying. I forget exactly when it was, but he just denied Carlick Jones the ball yeah. for like a whole shot clock basically. And then when he did get the ball, Carlick had nowhere to go. And yes, yeah. I mean, he was like, Carlick's like six foot on a good day to see right. Bam just dwarfing him in size and still be able to keep up. Like there's just so few, that's his argument, right? That's what he says all the time. Like there are so few guys who can do that as good as Joel Embiid is, as good as Anthony Davis is, two examples on this team. I don't think those guys have that same level of ability that he does to be able to do a feat such as that. Well, that's our friend Cooper Moorhead who works at heat over the heat.com and it's always talk about like guards learning quote the lesson, which is like mm-hmm. every time you think generally speaking, if you're an NBA point guard and you get a big man on a switch, you're like easy money. Like this is time to eat. And every the time and again, they pick bam on those and then they learn quote the lesson. And Carlick Jones, I think learned it pretty quick because right away he got off the ball. It was like, like you know, let me move it to the other side. There's, there's gotta be someplace else to attack. And that's kind of the thing with this team USA, when they've got those lineups on the floor and the starters are, are, are have been playing well defensively as well. It's not just that, but like the answer is there isn't another answer. And that's the best version of this team as constructed is to be, a- to be able to smother everything defensively with the size, with the athleticism. It's interesting, as you mentioned, Steve Kerr goes right away to the point of we're going to start Embiid and we're going to start Drew again against Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is a team that's built on uh, pl- you know, playing through small guards, playing through Jose Alvarado, playing through Tremont Waters, playing through Jordan, Haw- um, not Jordan Hawkins, Jordan Howard, excuse me. Uh, and they've got bigs who are not like stretch bigs, generally speaking, though, but they do have a lot of like six, seven, six, eight, six, nine guys. I watched them get waxed by Serbia yesterday. They had the unfortunate uh, problem of playing Serbia when Serbia needed to get back its point differential after getting blown out by the US. So Serbia just dropped a building on them and won by 41. Uh, Jose Alvarado also playing on a bum ankle really limits the ability that Puerto Rico has to generate offense. But so if you're looking at how you deal with Puerto Rico, all right, they're going to have to play through Jose Alvarado. Go get him, Drew. Uh, they're going to deal with some bigs that are going to try to like 
bully you inside and hit the glass. All right, Joel, this is an opportunity for your physicality. Also, go get those guys in some foul trouble. So there's I think there's a method to the madness for how Kerr is juggling the lineups. And we maybe do ourselves a disservice focusing overly on which guys don't play on a team that where there's anybody who doesn't play is an all star. You know, like it's you're kind of hard. Derek White hard should have been justice for Derek White. <laughs> right. Fair enough. Uh, I remember reading a good story about how he was a, an analytics all star, even if he didn't uh, he didn't actually make the team. Somebody wrote that. I forget who it was. It was me. It was I also, you. That's right. I also I wrote about Jordan Howard, whose name he butchered. If our listeners, hey, I had Jordan aren't. H, and I stumbled. There's, a, there's another NBA Jordan H. I had to get there. It was for also a Jordan Haw- Hawkinson, I believe, is his full name, the Japan center. But Jordan Howard, Decem- I just pulled out the link, December first, 2017, because I was watching. I remember I was watching back, back in my Super Draft days. I was watching tape of the UCLA just their early season run back when Lonzo Ball was at, maybe it was maybe again whatever it was a UCLA game I forget if Lonzo was there Jordan Howard just on Central Arkansas obliterated UCLA and I was like this guy's like five nine and he's sick so <laughs> I wrote a whole profile for SI.com about Central Arkansas star Jordan Howard so shout out Jordan Howard for bringing it still to this day. But yeah, I am not anticipating. I mean, 20 years ago, Carlos Arroyo famously was the small guard who led Puerto Rico to a massive upset over the 2004 Americans that preempted the Redeem team in 2008. I'm not getting my hopes up, unfortunately, for Puerto Ricans out there that are hoping for a repeat. 20 years later, unfortunately. But shout out to Jose Alvarado. Shout out to Josh Howard. And it's... Hold on a second. You just said shout out to Josh Howard. So after you oh on me for getting his name Josh wrong, Howard's you another guy I wrote immediately about. went and got it wrong yourself. So remove wow. the plank from your own eye, doctor. All right, let's get, let's get things straight. And about if one of us is making a mistake on our coffee, maybe the other one's making a mistake with our coffee too. You know, I'm just listen, saying. Listen, Josh Howard's another guy. I profiled in my early career. I remember it was at Summer League 2014. We were back at Thomas and Mack Center where he was an all-star. This guy makes some mistakes. It's just just a platform for him to tell another story. This is incredible. This is really funny because I remember, so I profiled Josh Howard. It was great. He was so nice. And running on Slam Online, the first platform that gave me a chance. And then this was back in the heyday of Grantland where anytime Jonathan Abrams wrote a profile, it like blew the hell up. And yeah. he had also profiled Josh Howard. And I remember one of my dad's best friends threatened I sue Grantland for him <laughs> plagiarizing me, <laughs> not understanding that sometimes when there's an obvious story multiple over like a two week long event, multiple people are going to pursue the same angle. And I don't think as like a 19 year old college sophomore intern, that was a good way to get myself on the the radar of some potential platforms that could have hired me. So I did not take legal action over yeah, that story. Probably a good choice. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that that one would have worked out very well for you. Uh, one last just thing to say on Team USA, Steph, 14 points on 17 shots through two games, three for 13 from three. Steve Kerr had made a point of saying before the South, the South Sudan game, it's time for us to get him going. He has not gotten going yet. Uh, on one level, you would assume Steph Curry is going to get going at some point because he is Stephen Curry. On another, it's worth remembering that he was not exactly a huge scorer on the two FIBA teams that he played on. 2010 World Cup averaged like five points a game in 10 minutes a game. Obviously, was like a more of a minor piece there. The 2014 World Cup, he was a star at that point, but it's like 10.6 points in 24 minutes a game. Shot well from three, but not an overwhelming. Like other guys were the star scorers on those teams. And so I think Steph seemed it was often pretty comfortable just being like, all right, you guys go ahead and I'll feed the ball. Like I'll move it around. Uh, I think he has seven assists through two games. Like he's playing well that way, but. Uh, we might not see Avalanche Steph, uh, you know, as to the degree that we might expect it. I, just want, I want to sort of caution people with that. And then, if, of course, if we do wind up seeing him hit nine threes against Puerto Rico, great. But I, <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily bank on it because I'm not sure that the run of the play is going that way. There will be some type because Steph's one shot he made against South Sudan, if I remember correctly, was the like last three in the last seconds of the game. And 
that's going to be important for tiebreaker stuff. Mm. Like all these teams that are advancing are are two and zero oh, from a seeding standpoint. Point differential is really important, just like the in season tournament, which you know took that formula from events such as this and. It's a different aspect of the game. That's why you saw Dylan Brooks take a last second three in Canada's first win of the tournament. So that's just something to keep an eye on. And if, if Steph can fill, if Steph can get hot in a blowout against Puerto Rico, it's not just a win for him finding his form. If it does add to that tiebreaker stuff that can help the seeding figure out, you know, it's going to be a crowded field in the knockout round. So, it, you know, all these teams are two and now you're going to need your help to get that, you know, quote unquote one seed and not just have a strong record. Yeah, as it stands, USA is that has the, the top point differential in the tournament, plus 43. Germany, plus 33 through two games. Uh, Canada, plus 17. France, plus 16. Serbia, plus 15. So, you know, your sort of usual suspects in terms of the teams you'd expect to be in medal contention, those are the ones that are 2-0. and oh, Those are the ones that are on the plus side of things. But uh, the margins need to, you know, the, yeah, you need to be mindful of the margins here. And you know, any any so as Serbia did against Puerto Rico, the U.S., you would imagine would try to do the same thing come Saturday. Anything else, Team USA, you want to touch on this episode? Uh, really great podcasting. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, this, was a, this was a setup. This was a setup for the next section that I thought you would pick up on, but that's OK. Oh, you mean, well, let's keep all this in. This is good podcasting, too, meaning setting you <laughs> up to go into your next thing. Yeah. <laughs> All right, dynamite. All right. Let me read, read the I mean, should, I, we, should we should we iron it out or just keep it rolling? I don't know. I feel like I feel like this has been a great show so far. I, I think it's going really well. Uh yeah. you know, Jake, the people's insider, as I understand it, <laughs> has little birds everywhere. And if I'm understanding correctly, you had a way to get some eyes and ears into what it's like to be a part of Team USA, even though you were not with the team. Can you tell me a little bit more about True. that? It's true. There you go. Thank you very much for that that that, that tee up right there. That lob. I, you know, to, to, if you want to tie this into stories of my of my youth of pursuing to feature clear, writing, I don't. But it seems like you really want. I said, to, I said so if someone do does <laughs> a word to aspiring journalists out there, when there is a top storyline in your beat, anything that can connect back to it in a different way that no one else is thinking about is a pretty interesting angle to see if there's something there. And, you know, I wasn't in, I wasn't at the mini camp stuff in Vegas. I didn't, I didn't uh, get to watch the Canada USA game live as I'd liked, as I would have liked to. But when I tuned into the Abu Dhabi exhibition, I saw Michael Potter on the Americans bench and Langston Galloway was there as well, and say with uh, Nigel Hayes, I believe. Langston Galloway made sense to me because he played on multiple World Cup qualifying teams, and the Team USA is very big on you know paying homage to the people who have been part of this program and what have you. And Michael Potter, to my recollection, had not. So I was really curious, A, why he was there, and B, as I learned reporting my book and just in general throughout my reporting career, when you talk to the 15th guy on the team, every practice, every game could be the biggest moment of their life compared sure. to sure. This is a huge moment for LeBron James. And one thing we didn't mention in the top that I would like to just say here, the fact that 39 year old LeBron is still obviously, obviously the biggest force on team USA is still something that is a spectacle to behold and amazing in its own. Right. So, to bring it back to Potter, like I thought there'd be something interesting there. Lo and behold, I did not recognize the type of unforgettable experience this guy has had, who, by the way, I will say, is arguably one of the better stretch big men available on the market right now in terms of like training camp invite guys. He's got two-way eligibility. He was on a two-way the last couple of years with Utah, if you're unfamiliar with who Michael Potter is. He played at Iowa, at Ohio State, transferred to Wisconsin. He had a 10-day with Detroit along the way. Like He is on the cusp, but he is someone who definitely a lot of talent evaluators will say is an NBA player. And Team USA identified over the last couple of years as we got confirmed from uh, director of the men's national team, Sean Ford, and also his head coach at 
the Salt Lake City Stars, Utah's G League team. Steve Wojciechowski, of course, played at Duke, longtime Duke assistant. There are many Duke ties to this program, from Coach K being the coach back in the day to Grant Hill being the you know general manager of this team right now. So he was you know pushing for Potter as well. Plus, he has that stretch shooting ability. He shot thirty seven percent over a large sample size, over 100 attempts from three this year in the G. Shot 50% on a limited sample size from three during 16 games for Utah this year. Plus, he's got the body. I, I forget if I've said it, 6'10", 248, to like really help train these dudes in practice. So that's what he did. And if you haven't read the story, he got really close with Joel Embiid, which is pretty cool. If you watched the exhibition against Germany, and if you're a Sixers fan... Like I know our friends at the Rights of Ricky Sanchez podcast, Spike Eskin and Mike Levin will definitely note, and anyone again who watches Sixers close to that, Joel Embiid's not exactly like a dunker. For someone so big with so much power, he's not coming down the lane and tomahawking on dudes all the time. So Michael Potter tells me that all of Team Musay during minicamp was just making fun of Joel for not dunking. So lo and behold, he lays down a hammer two-hand dunk on Germany. That one big highlight sequence, if people remember, he throws the dunk, goes down the court, just obliterates a shot, Ant goes down Eurostep dunk, that big highlight sequence. After Joel's two-hand dunk, he's pointing to the bench, and there's Michael Potter raising the roof because he instigated Joel Embiid's dunk. So that (laughs) was story one. Story two, he's also from Northeast Ohio. He's from Mentor which is about 50 minutes away from Akron, Ohio, where a certain famous kid is from. And he walked up to LeBron during one mini camp, told him that LeBron's face lit up. He was like, he said, quote, fucking right. And <laughs> they got close, close ish throughout the, the stretch. Cause him, Langston Galloway and Nigel Hayes were able to travel with team USA two of those exhibition slates while the other, you know, Cooper Flagg and Peyton Pritchard and Jaime Hawkins, that scrimmage team just got to go to Vegas and what have you. And at the end of their last exhibition slate, LeBron uh, unsuspectingly gave Micah Potter signed sneakers, game-worn sneakers, and wrote to Micah, hometown love with a heart. So that's a nice story. Yeah, that's really but, cool. Yeah. The craziest one was him saying he shared a van with Steph after a scrimmage practice whatever in london and that eventually there were five e-bikes trailing them through the streets swarming their van at the red light just trying to get a steph autograph which just must have been such a snapshot into the existence of a global phenomenon that is steph curry that not all of us will get so he's he's an nba player these men are his peers but of course he was hanging out with the Avengers for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, and and definitely found a lot of confidence. He said that like he knew it, that he belongs, but he went every day and competed like he belonged. He performed like he belonged. He prepared like he belonged, and he is ready for a real shot to hold an NBA roster spot this season. So shout out Michael Potter, and thanks for the time, man. It was a really cool story. Yeah, I would heartily recommend anybody check it out at Yahoo Sports. I read it this morning. I loved it. And I think it's the it is the right you, you are right to take a look for like where is the where is there something that gives you a sense of what it's like to be there, even if you're not like who's yeah, who is the person that can give you kind of a the normal person's view, quote, you know, sort of of what it's like to be next to these guys. Not I mean, as you mentioned, Micah Potter, NBA, uh, NBA caliber player and somebody who is in the world, but still like is somebody that I would imagine even among the more diehard listenership that we have might not be very familiar with him, might not have followed his collegiate journey, his pro journey. And so he gets to sort of stand in as the everyman for an audience, which is kind of neat. It's, it, it's, it's, it was a cool idea to find him there. And I'm glad that whatever editors, you, whosever arms you had to twist to write that story, uh, I'm, I'm glad you did. Yeah, just like when I said, hey, I, there's this really interesting thing about Tony Snell I want to explore here. They were like, ah, who cares about Tony Snell? Turns out a lot of people cared about Tony Snell. Yeah, no That kidding. is all we got for you for this opening section. <laughs> we're, we're, cutting, we're cutting it that break. short? All right. 
be an easy day at the office. We're going to take an ad break. We're going to get back to everyone's favorite segment, Five Out. And then we'll get out of here because I got plenty of di- plenty of stuff to do. I got nothing to do. I'm, I'm back, but it's fine. See you next time on No Cap Room. Welcome back to No Cap Room here on the Ball Don't Lie podcast. We are going to hit five NBA news stories of the week with everyone's favorite segment, Five Out. If you want to sponsor us, let us know. The Cavs, they have extended Jared Allen on a three-year, $91 million agreement. Dan, I had a first reaction to this. I'm curious if you did. Well, I say sort of just definitionally, I had to have a first reaction to it. Uh, yeah, yeah, I would say I was surprised by it. I mean, we've heard, I feel like Jared Allen's name has been in trade talks pretty consistently whether or at least in trade rumors rather whether the whether the the Cavs are actively accepting calls on him or making calls on him, that I don't know but his name comes up as a potential if the if Cleveland looks to move off of this core after f- failing in the first round against the Knicks a couple of years ago after falling short against Boston in the second round this year if they look at what their mix is and say we think our best version the best version of this team is not two bigs together with these two small guards. How do we pivot from it? The answer most often seems to be, what if we trade Jared Allen, especially after the fact of you extend Donovan Mitchell's contract, you give Evan Mobley the five-year rookie scale max. So then where are your transition points from there? And what the Cavs, the the signaling had been before this, they don't want to trade anybody. They change their coach from J.B. Bickerstaff. They bring in Kenny Atkinson. They think that there is a way to make get more out of what they currently have in store. And so what they do here by adding the three year, giving what winds up being the maximum extension they could give Jared Allen now, like under the collective bargaining agreement, you can extend guys at 140% of their current salary. He made 20 million last year. The extension starts at 28, which is 140%, goes up from there. The, The three years is the maximum they could go up because there's still two years left on his deal. This was as much money as they could give Jared Allen right now to line him up through 26, 27 with the rest of that core. And so what this signals is we believe in this enough that we don't, we want to remove the doubt for right now, at least about we're going to dismantle this and sell things off for parts. We believe that these four guys together are a powerful enough engine that it can get us deep into the playoffs and we can be a real contender, whether you believe that's true or not, you know, different people will have different opinions, but this is the Cavs saying enough with all this, when is this guy going to ask out? When is this mm-hmm. guy going to get traded? When are we going to pivot? We're not. We're going full steam ahead with this. And I think, you know, that's a that's a pretty interesting de- uh, decision for them to make and a pretty loud statement for them to do it. And they're paying an awful lot of money to do it. Yeah. I mean, if he signs pen to paper, and I should have just sent a text about this, so I'm, I apologize for not. That's the simplest thing to get confirmed when exactly he put pen to paper on this. But when he does... It will be six months to that date that he will be barred from being traded. So if it was as early as yesterday, that would take him all the way to January 31st, which would mean there's just a week window there before the trade deadline on February 6th to move him. So that already hampers that just from a sheer practicality standpoint. But yeah, it's to your point, like, yes, Cleveland officials have been telling me all throughout this offseason, that they have no intent on trading any of their core four. Doesn't matter if there was any early stink being raised from Clutch about Darius Garland, Donovan Mitchell fit. And doesn't matter if there are plenty of teams on the outside looking at the questionable fit between Jared Allen and Evan Mobley and saying, oh, the Cavs have to break that up because they all want to trade for Jared Allen. Right. So, you know, the head coach that you just mentioned that they replaced J.D. Bickerstaff with, Kenny Atkinson, is also the head coach who helped develop Jared Allen and Cavs backup guard Karis LeVert in Brooklyn into the players that Cleveland wanted to acquire. I mean, they they snuck into the four, what became a four-team trade with James Harden going from Houston to Brooklyn because the Rockets did not want to keep Jared Allen, if memory serves correctly. And Cleveland was like, oh, we'll take one of him. Thank you very much. (laughs) And they've been continuing to reward him ever since. You know, first signing that five-year 100. Now he's up to 30-ish AAV. 
And yeah, like one of my first blush reactions was it's tough news for the Pelicans, one of the teams that has been completely in the mix of teams that would absolutely like to get their hands on Jared Allen, especially in regards to any potential trade for Brandon Ingram, which we have continued to hear virtual radio silence about that. Yeah. And is, you know, BI's at 36. So in theory, this 30 million helps get closer to that number. And we'll see, like it still remains a possible match, but as we can shift into item two of five out here, the Cavs are 11 million under the luxury tax, the first apron as it stands or something plus or minus to that effect, including Isaac Okoro's cap hold of his 12 million ish uh, qualifying offer. And Cleveland, to my understanding, does not want to go into the apron this year, especially being that they are going to be paying into the tax as they pay all these dudes into the future. So Okoro remains number uh, one of the, I mean, I don't know what number he is after Tyus Jones is off, but he's got to be in the top handful of best players available on the open market in theory. Although he, how open when you're a restricted free agent, which is part of why he is still unsigned and part of why his situation remains undetermined. I know there was some reporting about there being like a Nets package idea where he would go to Brooklyn and there'd be something with Dorian Finney-Smith going back. I don't think that talk those talks ever got really, really substantial to my understanding. And also to my understanding, I just don't think it can even happen right now after the salary stuff has all shifted out. Like, I don't think Brooklyn has the room to make that happen. And that bringing back Dorian's like 14 million would be challenging for that first apron stuff that we're talking about with Cleveland in general. So I think... You know, Okoro could very easily just take that one-year qualifying offer that for very different circumstances we saw Miles Bridges just do in Charlotte and it worked out for him. Cleveland, you know, in certain certain situations with certain teams, I could see, and, you know, this happens, you could see a team like kind of burying a guy in a rotation if like he doesn't exactly take the deal that they would like. Like, generally speaking, Cleveland's business of operations is or Cleveland, we're not exactly a long-term free agent destination. We like to get guys locked in for five years. Like Darius Garland, I remember when his super max ext- or just max extension came out a year ago, two years ago. Like it was full five years, no player option. And like, yeah, because the Cavs don't want their players to get an option pretty typically. Like my understanding, why wouldn't Cleveland be trying to get a core on a longer term deal? I think it would benefit him. And, you know, the, the $12 million mark of that QL was going to serve as an obvious benchmark for what his general salary range was, is going to be. So I think that deal will get done. It's just a matter of how many years, I think. And that's kind of going to be a sticking point for, I mean, that's just what Cleveland does. That's their, that's their operations here. And, you know, depending on the AAV, like from an agent standpoint perspective, from a player's perspective, like, but we talked about with Andrew Nemhard, like you have to balance the what can I take now and lock in and guarantee versus how much is worth delaying my opportunity to get back onto the open market and potentially get a payday. But as we're seeing right now, taking the money you have in hand for non obvious plus 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 starter guys has been the smarter play of late. And look, Okoro's not a plus 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 starter guy. And I think that's what makes him a really tricky fit in Cleveland. And he had a great year last year too. He had a great year last year and the the shot played up. I think he shot 39% from three. So I shot like 40% above the break, which is something he'd never done. Um, the, the volume from the corners was up and the efficiency was there on that. He'd made strides as, you know, a guy that could put the ball on the deck, drive it and like beat a closeout and make a pass. Like there's growth in his game. But then it got to the playoffs again and no one was guarding him. And he shot, I think, like nine for 35 from three in the postseason and the minutes dwindled and he became a drain on that offense again. And that's whether that, you know, is going to be his ongoing issue as a player, whether I mean, young players can get better, shooters can improve. 
guys can reach a level where defenses have to respect them and that allows them to stay on the floor in these games that matter. It's there's nothing to say like it's impossible for him to be, I don't know, insert Derek Jones Jr. here or whatever, right? Like a plus defender who eventually gets good enough at the things that he needs to get good enough to be an impact player on teams of consequence. And maybe Cleveland, as you mentioned, being a team that does not always have the flexibility to get their pick of guys from that group would prefer to just pay up as long as it uh, it can to get him around and to be able to benefit from that growth should it continue. But I think it's it's interesting because if that's if that is what he is, if that is generally where he tops out as fourth or fifth option on offense, uh, plus defender, a guy who can be your best point of attack defender, but who's always going to be a they're going to leave they're going to make him leave, leave him alone to make him prove it shooter in the playoffs, and who's not a plus playmaker in a complimentary way that way. What what's the market for that guy is, is sort of I think the interest like because if you are an elite point of attack guy, then maybe it's Lou Dort money, right? If you're not and you're like good, but not great, and you're a good shooter, but you're not somebody that's going to threaten somebody in the playoffs and you're like an OK complimentary playmaker, but not a great one. It's I don't know, like, do, do you look at like the Aaron Wiggins deal? Is it like five years, 45? Is that a slap in the face for a guy who was a lottery pick? Maybe. But then like, wh- wh- I-, I don't know. I, I think I-, I kind of I think the value proposition of a Coro, given what we've seen, the difficulties he, he has finding or performing in the role that Cleveland needs him to perform in when they, you know, they they get to serious series and the fact that they went and they got Max Struess because they couldn't trust him to do that. Mm-hmm. Number think, five pick in the draft they were hoping would take that role. Yeah. And, and so it, it puts him uh, the, uh, the, the general squeeze of a restricted free agency. We talk about this at this point every summer. I feel like I wrote about it with Eric Bledsoe in Phoenix like a decade ago. <laughs> like this is the trap these guys get in. You know, you are good and you think you deserve X, but the system in, it puts you in a position to get squeezed for Y. I don't know. I, I, I would be surprised if it didn't get done because I just I can't imagine there's going to be a team like knocking down the door to say, well, not, let's gin up enough money to create an offer sheet for him. I, I don't see that happening. Yeah, but, I think Charlotte was a team to keep an eye on for him if Miles Bridges didn't go back, if he went somewhere else. But yeah, that option went off the table after he resigned for a lot of money. Yeah. And at this but, point in the offseason, they're just they're, there's not large available pools of money out there for teams that seem like they would really benefit from taking a big swing on a underperforming top five pick, you know? So I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I I bet he goes back there, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was maybe some hard feelings about it ultimately at the, at the way that it all gets done. I wouldn't necessarily say hard feelings. He did shoot 40% from three, give him some flowers there. I think, again, just a lot of figuring out this stuff is using the puzzle clues that you were already given. Sometimes it's a math equation and you're using the variables you already have and you're solving for X. That $12 million QO is is just naturally speaking, like when you look at these situations, it is the ballpark because it's already there. The one year 12 million has been offered because they did not they did not rescind that offer. So it's the starting point. It's the wiggle room that you could go back and forth. Something around that AAV I would expect to be the general, you know, outcome of this, but that wasn't the case for Nick's center, Precious Achua, who I think some people on the league were wondering if he would be willing to take a minimum to go somewhere with potentially higher uh, Eastern Conference contending odds. I want to say I heard one person say like. What if Precious Achua just took the minimum and went to Boston? Like, how, how much would that have really hurt the Knicks? You know, but that's just people drawing lines sometimes. He ends up re-signing with New York on a one-year, six million dollar deal, which our friend Fred Katz at the Athletic then further reported that Precious waived his bird veto rights, so he can be traded this season. So that's just an interesting little wrinkle. To me, I think it's more so interesting that he comes in at this number, which keeps the Knicks in good standing with luxury tax stuff. They'll continue to have flexibility, just like with potentially trading him to build this thing to contend with Boston. That is the ultimate goal here, that New York 
is doing everything they can to soup up this thing to try to get the shot and the crack at the Celtics that they were this close to getting a year ago. Or I guess in May. <laughs> <laughs> Just feels like a year. It's been a, it's been a long couple of months. It will be a year ago when the time comes. <laughs> <laughs> sure. The... It's, I think the Knicks bought the, but they bought out the bird, the bird rights veto option by going to 6 million. That's my guess is that it's like, if you want a contract that is higher than the minimum, which does not seem to be on offer for you anywhere else, uh, it's going to be so that we can use this down the line. And the way to use it down the line is little, as little you put pro quo. Yeah. As you mentioned, the. The Knicks, because of all the wheeling and dealing they did around the Mikhail Bridges trade and the brain signing back of OG Ananobi, the Knicks are over the first apron and hard capped at the second apron. Being over the first apron brings with it a bunch of restrictions. We've talked about some of those. One of them being you can't bring back more money in a trade than you send out. And the Knicks are a team where if they don't want to trade out of the top eight of that rotation, They've got to find other ways to potentially aggregate some salary together to if they if they find a move they want to make in the season. Well, if you've got Precious Achua at six million, which then does not put you over the second apron or, or it puts you in, it, uh, gives you some enough space under the second apron to still be able to use your taxpayer mid-level exception, five point two million dollars. If the Knicks want to do that, well, you add a six million dollar player and a five million dollar player. And you've got $11 million in wiggle room, maybe at a minimum in there. And you're at like 13 or $14 million in wiggle room to be able to say, if we put that with some draft capital, you can go maybe shopping at the trade deadline for someone making 11, 10, 11, $12 million who might be able to be a tangible impact player on a team with championship aspirations. So that's one way this can go is that Precious Achua much like KJ Martin in Philadelphia, like we talked about, Rashawn Holmes in Washington, maybe even uh, Jonas Valanciunas in Washington, uh, Josh Kogi in Phoenix. These guys are sort of getting paid more to be able to be used as trade chips later under this new set of circumstances. The other way it could work out is Isaiah Hartenstein's gone and the Knicks really need somebody to play backup center. And by the way, Precious Achua was pretty frigging good for the Knicks when he actually got the chance to play last season after they came over in the OG Ananobi trade. Averaged over more than seven points and seven rebounds a game. Shot well over 50% for them. Uh, was blocking shots, able to switch on defense. When he, they when it, I guess, got racked by injuries and he needed to start, he averaged, I think, like almost 13 and 10 for a month, whatever that was, between late January and or early March. So a guy who has played minutes there actually fit in surprisingly or surprised me how well he fit in with Tom Thibodeau and that and what they asked of him on defense and was somebody who made a real impact to a team that the vibe was good and they wanted to bring back as much of that as possible. So there's a walkway there or a runway there for him to be able to earn that backup center job and just make it so that the Knicks maybe don't need to go make some bigger move to add a bigger piece if they don't feel like they they need to. But Generally speaking, Tibbs has always wanted to play bigger five guy, five men than you know a six eight six nine switch big. So maybe they still want to go out looking for that guy. This now affords them more opportunities to do that, either looking to aggregate salary for a uh, a bigger deal or just saying we got a six million dollar salary we can flip for somebody that's still making money in that range. It gives them some more options and solves maybe solves some problems for them in the short term too. Item four of our five out here, the Grizzlies have re-signed Luke Kennard to a one-year reported $11 million deal. I have been told by a capologist buddy that the math with this moves they've made puts this probably at a $10.9 million deal if we want to be a stickler. And this was always expected. Like We put this in our running live blog uh, during June 30th that he was going to be his to have his team option decline and come back. And I think a lot of the holdup was just accounting on Memphis' side of things. Like I was told that the deal needed to wait, like this deal needed to wait for the Zaire Williams trade to Brooklyn to be official. And like literally Zaire Williams' physical pass, the Nets announced it. And then Luke Cunard was done. <laughs> so sometimes that's just how the math 
all works and figures it out. I just think, generally speaking, he remains one of the best shooters in the league. And the Grizzlies have really rounded out their group again for what Memphis certainly believes is going to be with a new coaching staff largely behind Taylor Jenkins as well, with John Morant back, with Jaron Jackson healthy, that they're going to be as big a player as anyone in this loaded, loaded Western Conference. So it'll be interesting to see where they stack up and all that stuff and how big a role Luke Kennard can play in stretching the floor for John Morant running around seven foot five guys screens, maybe. (laughs) So, yeah. The last time we got to see any kind of uh, John Morant playing with Luke Kennard and Desmond Bain, like there was only a very limited window for that group to play together after Luke Kennard got to Memphis from the Clippers and bef- around Jaws injuries and suspensions and absences and all that sort of stuff. But a couple of years ago, they played like 100 minutes of a three guard lineup with Kennard, John Morant, and Desmond Bain, and they outscored opponents by 91 points in 102 minutes, and they scored like 144 points per 100 possessions with those guys on the floor together. So the idea of you have two five alarm shooters, you know, flanking Jaw, I think there's a lot. There's some. It's going to create some defensive issues, but there's some something powerful there as an off speed pitch for the Grizzlies. I'm really looking. I would like to see some more of that. Um, A couple of Luke Kennard numbers. Like pretty much every member of the Grizzlies, he missed more than last half of last season due to injury. But he still made a hundred a hundred threes in fewer than a thousand minutes, which is pretty cool. Uh, and since he entered the league 2017-2018, he's one of eleven players that's made more than seven hundred fifty threes and hit him at better than a fifty percent clip. You're talking about shooters like Steph, Clay, Cat, Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, then uh, more role player types: Joe Ingles, Boyan Bogdanovich, Buddy Heald, Norm Powell, and Joe Harris. So that is the efficiency volume kind of guy that he is that he can be on this Grizzlies team and when you look in at what they're bringing back there we're probably looking at Zach Eady starting next to Jaron Jackson Jr. You got to figure if they bring him in with the, num- the number nine pick, they're probably seeing a large role for Zach Eady. And also, if you're going to play him, you might as well start him now because he's not exactly a, a young developing prospect. He kind of is who he is now. So Eady alongside Jaron Jackson Jr. And then some some combination, maybe uh, Desmond Bain, Marcus Smart and John Morant. You bring Brandon Clark healthy off the bench with Santi Aldama, Vince Williams and Gigi Jackson. They were two huge finds last year in the lost season. You bring Kennard back. That's a 10 man rotation. That's like a bunch of real NBA players. And then behind them, there's, you know, John Conchar and Jake LaRavia. Derek Rose is on this team, by the way. Uh, and Scotty Pippen Jr. That who's looked great for them in, in the summer league. There is real talent here and there's a lot of ways to play. And the last couple of times we actually had most of the Grizzlies healthy. They won 50 plus games and were the number two seed. So, I'm not saying they're going to immediately vault right back up to that level, but I think this is it's sort of quietly a nice finishing touch on a really nice bounce back off season for the Grizzlies. And I'm really excited to see how that team plays. Yeah, they're a team that's going to be high up in my league pass queue to start next season. Our final item of five out before we get out of here is about Gordon Hayward getting out of here. He announced right before we started recording that he is retiring from the NBA after a pretty decorated overall basketball career. When I think of Gordon Hayward, I close my eyes and I see the ball bouncing off the backboard, bouncing off the front rim and almost ending the hopes and dreams of another Duke championship. I'm curious, Dan, I don't know if you saw it in the slack before we start. Do you know how much money Gordon Hayward made over his entire career? His entire career. All right. So he he was only like, like, like a his, ballpark guess. I'm like like 150, 175. Because he he his his all star peak was before the money got nuts. Mm-hmm. But he got two hundred plus million dollar deals. He got the one Charlotte deal was big. That's right. The Charlotte deal the was Charlotte like deal was super a surprisingly. What are you guys doing? Big. All right. The Charlotte deal. That 4 120 he got from the Hornets, which, if people forget, was after you know, that gruesome ankle injury 
opening night in Boston where it's supposed to be him and Kyrie and Al Horford propping up the two Js and they're going to make this run against LeBron. First play, alley-oop, ankle, done for the year. Then he gets, he goes to Charlotte by way of sign and trade for Kemba Walker, which was the Celtics' quick response to losing Kyrie Irving to the Nets. And then we kind of never really heard from Gordon Hayward again. He had a ton of injury stuff with the Hornets. I know from over the years, from various different iterations of leadership and staff members in that organization, he was kind of the Hornets version of Tobias Harris in Philly. But if Tobias Harris was supposed to be your best player, and I want our listeners to remember that Pre Donovan Mitchell coming onto the scene in Utah, Gordon Hager was a crunch time ball handler, lethal scorer, all star dude who was leading the Jazz to the second round of the playoffs before the Celtics injury, before he kind of went to no man's land in Charlotte. And coaches there were always kind of wringing their hands, being like, Where is this guy? And he's a video gamer who, like, net doesn't really hang out with the young dudes all that much. Like, he never became the next gen kind of like David West to the Indiana Pacers back in the Paul George days that I think Hornets people were hoping him to be. But the guy was like the peak of his Utah days. I remember really falling in love with the Jazz. I guess it was the 15, 16 season because I was on the night desk at Sports Illustrated and the Warriors were the talk of the town, the talk of the world. But a lot of Warriors games by like midway through the third quarter were just absolute blowouts. And when you're on the <laughs> desk at East on the East Coast at like 1 a.m., you're looking for some type of entertainment. Gordon Hayward's Utah Jazz were coming and they were great. And he played his way into being the top free agent of that offseason in 2018, 2017, whichever 2017. year it was that Chris Haynes put out the Hulk Hogan meme, which I which I made a joke with to Chris at a dinner during Vegas. And I love when Chris Haynes cackles laughing from his belly. It's like the funniest thing ever. I'm not going to impersonate it, but I really am fighting every urge <laughs> in my body to not do it. That's so good. yeah, Gordon Hayward, great career, great tennis player, beautiful hair. I remember when he did sign to Boston, I reached out to his agency priority and said, hey, let me go with Gordon to f- write a story about trying to find his barber in Boston. That didn't work out. <laughs> but yeah, kudos on retirement. And... His final, I think, stamp footprint on the NBA, not really his playing time in OKC. The trade for out of Charlotte to the Thunder ended up benefiting OKC's books, getting off of Trey Mann and Vasily Michus, whose salary is long term. Davis Bertans is expiring salary from last season. Indirectly, directly, whatever, however directly it was, that trade absolutely benefited the Thunder and gave them the space to give the massive deal that they gave to Isaiah Hartenstein. So Gordon Hayward's Thunder tenure lived so Isaiah (laughs) Hartenstein's could die. And I'm sure Thunder fans everywhere are going to thank him for his services. I mean, it's certainly they'll they'll thank him more for that than they did the world for anything that he did in a Thunder uniform, which was not uh, not exactly the stuff of stirring highlight reels. I had high hopes for the Gordon Hayward signing because I was like, oh, yeah, big, uh, big combo forward who can shoot off the, can, you know, be an off ball shooter and uh, say in a secondary playmaker like, yeah, he makes a ton of sense for what the Thunder need and then <laughs> did not actually work out at all there. I don't have a, a ton to say about this, except that it's it is you know, really, really brutal that the injury was so severe, so dramatic, and so lingering at the absolute peak of his career that he was 27 years old when he got to Boston. And that's when it's supposed to like, you're at your apex there and goes up. Yeah. I mean, I I was watching, I was writing about that game that night. I was working here and I was going to be writing off of it and, you know, having to to the immediate response to this is gruesome and catastrophic and like maybe don't watch the video clip that I have to embed mm-hmm. in here by, you know, as a, a a matter of course. And it was just it was absolutely sickening. And, and, and it on one level, it's devastating because the guy he was before that, again, I don't expect people to remember, especially our younger uh, listeners in the four. He became only really became a starter in 2013, like full time 
He had been like uh, kind of on and off off the bench in Utah. But the four years before he got to Boston, those last four years in Utah, 19 points, five rebounds, four assists per game on like above average shooting efficiency. That's like the only guys who've done that for careers are basically Hall of Famers, Brandon Ingram and Zion Williamson. That's like it's kind of guys who have won MVPs who will be Hall of Famers and then Brandon Ingram and Zion Williamson. And so like if you're if the worst, like the low end of where you were at that kind of approaching the peak of your game is B.I. and Zion, like it's not it's not all that bad, right? It's a pretty decent neighborhood to be in. And then if the upper echelon of that is like, again, literally we're talking about the best forwards of all time, LeBron and Bird, guys like that. So I don't think he was ever going to get there necessarily, but he was on a trajectory to a multiple time all star, multiple time, you know, like significant long term career. And so Mm -hmm. that that does not wind up happening is something of a basketball tragedy. Right. The flip side of it, that he eventually did get back enough to where he averaged like 20, 20 a game for a season in Charlotte. Now, those teams were not really teams of consequence, but he recovered enough of himself to still be able to produce roughly and relatively for a while like what he used to be after several years of false starts and I would have to imagine grueling rehab and really difficult mental and physical work to get himself back there. So to decide at this point in his career, 14 years down the line after you know his last hope at, a, at a, making an impact on a playoff team didn't work out to decide to just you know, cash it in and go from here. Like I, I get it, but there's something noble to the idea of like you want to go through what he went through and still be able to recover enough of it. I think mm-hmm. there's something to be said for that. So yeah, like I will always wonder what that team would have looked like if we got the full, the full look at what Gordon Hayward actually could have been. I will always wonder how Kyrie Irving's experience in Boston would have gone had Gordon Hayward been healthy and had that team evolved differently. There's a million sort of rip, uh, downstream ripple effects from that, but uh, mm-hmm. The career that Gordon Hayward got wound up being uh, didn't wind up being maybe what we would have hoped for, but I think wound up being better than you would have hoped for at that moment, given yeah. everything that he was dealing with. And you mentioned LeBron. If people forget in 2014, when he was a restricted free agent, he got an offer sheet from Charlotte that you ended up matching. But also he was like the top guy, like he visited Cleveland he was the top guy on the Cavs board if LeBron didn't go back to the Cavs to start that whole second chapter there. So he was definitely one of those guys, one of those next all-star type guys around the league that a lot of people were trying to receive his services. And the answer to our trivia question, he ended up cashing out $270 million over his 14 years. So Gordon Hayward... I don't blame you for trying to find a $3.3 million vet minimum somewhere to just ride off into the sunset. He's a family guy. Go have fun with your kids. Go never get hurt again. And I wish you hit that bank shot against Duke. That's all we've got for you today. <laughs> Thanks to super producer John Gennaro, who does all the things to make the show look and sound great. Please subscribe to Ball Don't Lie on YouTube or whatever podcast platform you're currently listening on and leave us a five-star review. We thank you for listening and we'd appreciate it if you came back again next week for another episode of No Cap Room.